The New Age is a bit difficult to define, because unlike most formal religions, it has no holy text, central organization, membership, formal clergy, geographic center, dogma, creed, etc. It's a network of believers and practitioners who share somewhat similar beliefs and practices. These beliefs can be added to whichever formal religion they follow, if any. In the last 10 years, the New Age has shifted out of the counterculture and into the mainstream of society. Today, its effects are felt in almost every aspect of life. Medicine, politics, science, psychology, and even religion. A number of common beliefs are held by many, but not all, New Age followers. Individuals are encouraged to kind of shop for their beliefs and practices that they feel most comfortable with, kind of like a buffet line. Uh, some of these common beliefs are things like personal transformation, the idea that mystical experience will lead to transformation. Methods to attaining that include things like hypnosis, meditation. Some believe that hallucinogenic drugs are useful to bring about and enhance this transformation. Believers hope to develop new potentials within themselves, the ability to heal oneself and others maybe, or psychic powers, new understandings of the workings of the universe, etc. Other common beliefs are divination and miscellaneous occult activity, really anything occult, astrology, tarot cards, runes, numerology, dream interpretation, I could go on and on and on, uh, channeling, which is allowing spirits to talk through you in order to get information. Channeling is actually really a foundational thing in the New Age, as we will see later. Pantheism, this is the idea that all that exists is God. And this leads really easily and naturally to the concept of the divinity or godhood of the uh, individual or person. The idea that we are all gods. Reincarnation. This is the idea that after death we are reborn and live another life as a human. And the cycle repeats itself many times. Also the human potential movement. It's the concept of cultivating extraordinary potential. Adherents believe that the net effect of individuals cultivating their potential will bring about positive social change at large. The idea of transcendental meditation, everybody getting together and thinking about a particular subject and it having some effect on society. UFOs. A huge percent of New Agers hold a completely unshakable belief in the reality of UFOs. Often that humanity was genetically engineered by UFOs and that that explains the origin of life. Again, all this is kind of like the buffet line of the New Age. Some New Agers believe only parts of this stuff. Some of them may not believe any of these things. But the New Age does have certain core beliefs. These would be beliefs that are really the glue that holds the otherwise chaotic differences of the buffet together. Also, many times people hold these beliefs that I'm about to name and don't even realize that they are core New Age beliefs. One of these core New Age beliefs is where the New Age gets its name from. The term New Age refers to the Aquarian Age, where it did originally, which according to New Age followers is just around the corner, and it's supposed to bring in peace and enlightenment and world unity. And really, those details aren't necessary for them to believe. It's not even necessary that they believe that it's a result of the Age of Aquarius. A lot of people believe that a New Age is coming as a result of, say, 2012, or that we're going to approach a photon belt, or all these ideas, and some of the things that they think will happen will differ too. But the concept that a New Age is just around the corner is very prevalent, and that's why I called it a core New Age belief. Another core belief is closely related and often associated with the idea of the Age of Aquarius, and that is the coming spiritual evolution of mankind. There are so many different versions of what this spiritual evolution will look like that it won't really do too much good to name them all, but just know that there is an idea that a physical evolution, like they will describe Darwinian evolution and have all kinds of graphs and things about that, and then they'll say to expect that type of evolution in a spiritual sense and as I said oftentimes this, this is associated with the coming age of Aquarius or however they believe that's supposed to happen. Another core New Age belief is that man is inherently good or even divine or that he can be divine if certain conditions are met. A lot of emphasis is put on the potential for man to become like God or to have God-like powers or mind powers or something. Often that's tied to the previous idea of evolution, 
the idea that we are evolving into gods, and that's what we would call evolutionary godhood, and that it's the next step in evolution. Another fundamental thing taught is that the Bible cannot be trusted as is, and that biblical Christianity is one of, if not the biggest problem that the world must overcome in order to have this new utopia. Sometimes those in the New Age talk about Jesus and Christianity in a good light. They especially did this early on in the New Age. A lot of Christian vocabulary was used, but none of them would say that the Bible is inspired or that the Bible means what it says. In fact, even if they didn't claim that the Bible was corrupted, they might claim that you have to interpret the Bible in this special esoteric way in order to get what it truly means. And they have a lot of antagonism and even hatred for those people that do believe the traditional biblical view. And that antagonism is really always under the surface in the New Age. But in the new New Age, as I like to call it, the one that has begun to form after 9-11, has really become more overt and openly antagonistic towards Christianity and Christians. Very little peace and love from them on that topic. World unity or a coming utopia is always a part of it. Early on it was Atlantis. You still hear a bunch about the return of Atlantis or the new Atlantis. Um, there's often an economic unity involved there, a world government sometimes, sometimes even a single world leader, uh, especially within theosophy. Uh, but it's also hoped for in theosophy that that leader will unite the world into spiritual unity, that is a one world religion. And this is one of the most talked about plans at the highest levels of those that promulgate the New Age, such as Alice Bailey. Also related to this is the term New World Order, a term which Alice Bailey used quite a lot to describe this utopia. She says that as the age of Aquarius unfolds, the New Age will develop, and that will be a utopia in which there is a world government, an end to wars, disease, hunger, pollution, poverty, and especially an end of all religions. Some form of Luciferianism, usually this is hidden or allegorical or poetic, but it's always there, some form of veneration of Lucifer and the characteristics that are associated with him, even if they don't believe in Lucifer. Most of the early New Age writers were open Luciferians, but nowadays this Luciferianism takes all kinds of different shapes. Usually they just reinterpret the Garden of Eden story in some symbolic way that makes the serpent in the story look good, yet they may have no belief whatsoever in God or Lucifer. For example, Michael Tessarian talks about the Garden of Eden story as if it is talking about genetic manipulation of aliens. Anyway, to make a long story short, Lucifer comes out the awesome you know, champion of the story and God comes out the vindictive evil God that was trying to keep them prisoner in the Garden of Eden. And I could go on and on about the way that Lucifer is venerated, whether it's in symbols or, or whatever. You know, David Icke always talks about how the sun is going to change us in the future. You know, the, our, our godhood is going to come from the, from the sun. It's just an obvious uh, Luciferian uh, reference there. But uh, another one is secret knowledge. That is a really key component to the New Age. And it's the idea that if you know the right stuff, you read the right books, that there is power available for you. It's kind of this carrot on the string. And humans are just really, really vulnerable to this type of seduction, that there is a secret knowledge out there. I know when I got into the New Age, it was this idea that there was a secret knowledge that they knew about. And if I learned it, I could have all this power that really got me on the road to all kinds of you know, uh, New Age and occultism and things like that. Okay, so in this talk I'm going to be giving you a presentation essentially of my opinion on the purposes of the New Age movement from the satanic perspective. And I say it that way because the New Age movement has no headquarters. There is no agenda from the top in a physical sense. But I do believe that there is an agenda, and in fact a very methodical agenda, but it is one from a spiritual perspective and it is essentially enforced and maintained by spiritual beings, kind of a hierarchy or a type of military system that does in fact go to the top. And that's what I would say the eye of the pyramid is, is in fact Satan himself. So what is the agenda from that perspective? Short term, it's to get well-meaning people to open doors of demonic influence in their lives by practicing the occult. 
Long term, it's to prepare the world politically, psychologically, and spiritually for the Antichrist and his attempt to cause the world to worship him. Now, this not only includes preparing minds and acclimating them to the spiritual prerequisites, but also a physical building up of the control grid, the, the system, the new world order of control that will be able to terminate, to kill those that refuse to worship him. And this is why people seem to notice a very well-planned agenda behind what seems to be a totally unconnected movement. There is a plan in the spiritual dimension, and it is a plan that has been around for a long time. Some key points to be aware of as we progress is, first, that the New Age is sold to the public using pseudoscience. What that means is that it uses supposed facts and figures and charts and graphs and phrases like, scientists now know to get people to think that the New Age beliefs are grounded in fact. And the interesting and kind of funny thing is that they rarely agree on what those facts are. For instance, let's take one of the most basic ideas in the New Age, the idea that a New Age is in fact coming. That idea is taught to people using many types of methods, using sometimes mutually exclusive ideas. One might believe that the New Age is coming, for example, as a result of the galaxy's position in relation to the sun. Or another person might believe that it's because the solar system's position in relation to the so-called photon belt. Totally exclusive ideas. Another third exclusive idea that's commonly believed is that it's about the sun's position in relation to certain constellations, or astrology, as we mentioned earlier. Another person might believe a combination of those with 2012, or none of them at all, completely different one. It really doesn't matter how that they were sold the idea. What matters is that they believe that a new age is coming. New Age beliefs are tailored towards the individual. There is a form of New Age out there for every type of personality. If you, for instance, have a Christian background, there is a form that speaks really highly of Christ and, and you might, for instance, find Eckhart Tolle to be useful. Now, if you hate Christians, there's plenty of other directions that you would be geared for. If you believe in UFOs or could believe in UFOs, there's tons of New Age versions for you. If you are absolutely adamant that UFOs don't exist, that's fine. There's tons of New Age authors and teachers just for you, too. And the next key point kind of goes along with that. Even if you don't want to be called New Age or wouldn't associate yourself with a New Age belief, that's okay because most of the people today that believe New Age principles don't call themselves New Agers or wouldn't associate with the term. In fact, two of the biggest teachers of the New Age alive today are very outspoken against the New Age. Yet, just a simple examination of their beliefs show that they are about as New Age as anyone could ever get. Kind of related to that is there's a huge move in corporate America. Lots of Fortune 500 companies uh, actually teach New Age principles and workshops and things like that, but they don't use a lot of the buzzwords that are commonly associated with the New Age. And finally, on the key points, much truth. That's the whole idea. A lot of truth has to be used for this to be relevant. That's the reason it's been so tied to the, the movement of knowledge on the Internet the last 10 or so years. People have been learning good facts from these people, really important things about politics or science or, or medical stuff or food poison stuff. All these types of things are part of the truth. That's the hook. The, the health food industry, really the organic food industry, really was born out of true things. Monsanto and, and DDT back in the, in the 70s or whatever, when people found out about that stuff, <clears throat> they wanted to eat organic. All that stuff was true. Everybody looked at them like they were crazy. But they were taught the pesticide kind of stuff as a means of drawing them into all the other stuff. Oh, didn't you know all the pesticide stuff is true? Now let me also tell you about the age of Aquarius or, or whatever. It's the same principle today. Um, a few numbers here. A 2009 study was done on 4,000 Americans. Basically, to go through this really quickly, 25% of them believed in reincarnation. Among Christians, the number drops only slightly to 22%. 65% uh, of people in this study express belief in at least one of these uh, New Age ideas, and 43% of young adults believed in some type of astrology. 
So let's look at the origins of the New Age movement. In one sense, this all began in the Garden of Eden. Genesis 3 verses 4 and 5 says, And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day that ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. So if we break this down a little bit, we're going to see all these elements of the core New Age beliefs. First, this, ye shall not surely die. So Satan is saying here, um, he's discrediting the word of God. Did God say that? Well, why don't you reconsider whether or not he really did mean that? So one of the core New Age beliefs, a discrediting of the word of God, is certainly here in this. And of course, they did surely die. They didn't die right then. It's kind of, again, sort of this idea of, of playing a little bit of truth to his advantage. Another part of that is God doth know. So what he's essentially saying is here, God knows that when you eat it, your eyes are going to be open. He, he's casting God as the bad guy, Satan is here. He's reversing the roles. And this is, uh, we see this in the New Age with the Luciferianism. Again, trading the roles, making Lucifer the good guy and God the bad guy. Another part of this, he says, your eyes shall be opened. So there is a promised enlightenment, a potential coming enlightenment is coming. Another one is, ye shall be as God. So there is an offer of an evolution from what they were to godhood, in a sense. And what does he say that will be manifested by? By knowing. So he was claiming that there was a knowledge that they could attain to if they would do that, almost a secret knowledge. So again, we have a core belief there. So in a sense, the new age is not new at all. So occultism in the old world in a broad sense is a picture of the new age but really this started to develop in earnest after the time of Christ. In the second century Irenaeus wrote against heresies. He cataloged the beliefs and history of the Gnostics. The Gnostics really offered a hybrid Christianity offering a lot of occult themes with Christian vocabulary and, and backgrounds and things and that idea sort of stayed with the Gnostics for some time, but the idea of incorporating biblical vocabulary is really at the roots of the modern New Age movement. In the 1700s, the Christian mystics like Emanuel Swedenborg arrived, and that's basically occultism with Christian vocabulary, as I said. And all that culminated in the writings of Helena Blavatsky and the Theosophical Society and then there was a whole lot of stuff that followed that, which basically used their themes and developed them. But where Satan's plan for the Antichrist starts to really become a bit more noticeable is with the writings of two main people, Helena Blavatsky and Alice Bailey. Let's talk briefly about Blavatsky first. She was born in 1848. In 1875, she formed the organization called the Theosophical Society. She founded the society with two men, Colonel Henry Steele Alcott and William Kwan Judge. Blavatsky's influence came mostly from her writings. Her first book was entitled Isis Unveiled, published in 1877. She started a magazine called Lucifer Magazine. Her principal work, The Secret Doctrine, was published in 1888. And contained in those writings are the doctrines that helped really form the New Age movement to what it is today. It is said that part of Blavatsky's book, The Secret Doctrine, was channeled to her through a, quote, ascended master or, quote, highly evolved being called Kuthumi. This being apparently spoke through her, and belief in these ascended masters who communicate with humanity is very crucial when studying and trying to understand the New Age. As we will see, the New Age doctrine was entirely given to us by spiritual beings which I would argue are biblical demons. Then in 1880, Alice Bailey was born. She really emphasized the need for humanity to make a one-world government and a one-world religion for this theosophical Age of Aquarius idea. Alice Bailey formed the Lucifer Publishing Company in 1920. In 1922, she changed the name to Lucius Trust. Lucius Trust basically promoted the work of one of these, quote, ascended masters who called himself Dejwa Kool, who was working through Alice Bailey for some 30 years. This demonic force wrote volumes of material through Bailey, and those writings serve as the basis for all New Age thought. I mean, I almost can't be more emphatic about that. Almost every tiny little New Age concept 
can probably be tracked back to something in her extensive writings. But her writings are very cryptic and they, they almost need a dictionary of terms in order to understand what she means by certain things. And almost no New Ager reads her work. What has happened is that the New Age gurus spend the time reading her work and then they teach the concepts that she, that she teaches to their followers filtered through their own personal beliefs and eliminating all the references to New World Order and you know the World Teacher and all this stuff. Again, the New Ager does not need to know where this stuff comes from. They just need to believe the basic principles. Quoting Terry Melanson here, it says, Lucius Trust is a powerful institution that enjoys consultative status with the United Nations, which permits it to have a close working relationship with the United Nations, including a seat on the weekly sessions, but most importantly, influence with powerful business and national leaders throughout the world. Through its founding of World Goodwill, Lucius Trust is, quote, aggressively involved in promoting globalist ideology. Here's a quick quote to illustrate just one aspect of her position regarding the coming world government and the control that it needed. She said, In the preparatory period for the New World Order, there will be a steady and regulated disarmament. It will not be optional. No nation will be permitted to produce or organize equipment for destructive purposes or to infringe the security of any other nation. Bailey was always referencing something called, quote, the plan. This not only called for steps to begin to influence world government, but it also included a plan to spread the ideas of the Luciferian New Age in preparation for a man that they sometimes called the world teacher. This plan was admittedly to prepare the human thoughts to accept this new world order and new world ruler when he finally comes. One quote from her regarding this says, This must form the theme of all the propaganda work to be done during the next few decades, until the year 2025. A brief space of time indeed to produce fundamental changes in human thought, awareness and direction, but at the same time a quite possible achievement, provided the new group of world servers and the men and women of goodwill perform a conscientious task. So we'll talk about these this group later on, but what she's wanting them to do is to produce propaganda to essentially change human thought and awareness and direction in preparation for her new world order, in preparation for the world teacher. Another quote says, The day is dawning when all the religions will be regarded as emanating from one great spiritual source. All will be seen as unitedly providing the one root out of which the universal world religion will inevitably emerge. Then there will be neither Christian nor heathen, neither Jew nor Gentile, but simply one great body of believers gathered out of all the current religions. So you can see that she intends to produce propaganda to get the world to think the way that she wants them to think. I want to point out by showing the Luciferian roots of Theosophy that it is their intense veneration of Satan and Lucifer and their hatred of God that I think makes it uh, not all that unlikely that they could be used to promote this very important satanic aspect that is preparation for the Antichrist because they were so given over to it. Helena Blavatsky writes that it is but natural to view Satan, the serpent of Genesis, as the real creator and benefactor, the father of spiritual mankind. She has a lot of quotes like this, but I'll just read a few of them. She also writes that Lucifer is the Logos in the highest. She writes that Satan is the god of our planet and the only god. She sums up on page 513 of The Secret Doctrine by writing, Lucifer is divine and terrestrial light, the Holy Ghost and Satan, and that our temp he is also our tempter, redeemer, our intelligent liberator and savior. And it's not just her. Plenty of theosophists wrote these types of quotes. I have pages and pages of other theosophists like Alexander Fussell and N. Sri Ram, from publications like Lucifer Theosophical Magazine just lavishing praise for Lucifer or Satan. Now we're kind of finished with the history of the New Age and what it's about and we're going to transition now into how that relates to the Antichrist. So let's start off by just naming a short list of the Antichrist's objectives. First, a world religion in which he forces everybody to worship him. This is seen in many different places in the Bible. 
also a world economy and bureaucracy that requires submission to him. Not just any economy, but an economy that is essentially predicated on submission to him. We see this with, among other things, the mark of the beast. No one can buy or sell unless they have it. Uh, they have to get it on the right hand forehead. A lot of red tape there. A lot of people that have to be involved in that. Not to mention you have to have control of the buying and selling in order to limit who gets to do it. Uh, also, we see a total elimination of Christians. We see this in a number of places. Revelation 12, Revelation 13. Now, if you look at this list, I hope that you're struck with the impossibility of this mission in the current world that we live in. And I know a lot of people are saying, no, wait, you know, a world religion and a world economy, this is just right around the corner. All this stuff could happen any minute. And I want to take a look at that idea. You know, we would say, okay, the let's say, for instance, with the world religion, the ecumenical movement is the precursor for the Antichrist world system, or perhaps, you know, Muslim uh, extremism is the, the new coming world religion. And I agree that some of that has a part in this. We're still a million miles away from an ecumenical movement or anything like that that's going to cause everybody to worship a one world dictator as if he is higher than God himself. You know, no ecumenical movement of the Catholic Church or no, uh, 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 you know, Muslim extremism is going to cause people to freely and desire to give their worship to a single man. We are, we are a million miles away from that happening. You know, if Muslims come over here and try to kill us all with a sword and, and try to, to get us to convert at sword point, that doesn't explain so much of the Bible, which seems to suggest that much of the world is seduced and desires very much to be a part of this new system. Something significant is being told about in these passages, something different than what we're seeing. You might say also in the same idea that the world economy is right around the corner. I mean, you know, all this stuff is going to, one world currency and all this stuff, and I would say, yeah, maybe that is. It could easily happen very, very soon, but not a world economy that requires you to pledge your allegiance to one man and to give one man your worship. You know, that would be a hard sell to militant atheists or radical Muslims or Buddhists or Catholics or anyone these days. You know, a one world economy, sure, but not a one world economy that is based on the worship of a man. Also, you might say that the killing of Christians could happen any day. You know, after all, there's persecutions going on right now in other countries. You could say there's lots of anti-Christian attitudes that are getting awful, neo-atheism, radical Islam again. But no matter how bad that it gets... In this current paradigm that we live in, when we're all ostensibly trying to live green and, and be politically correct, something different must occur for the entire world to be okay with a total religious genocide. What I'm trying to get everybody to understand is that this system will require a catalyst, an event or set of circumstances that will change everything about how the world views religion and God. Now you have to think big because nothing less than a total world paradigm shift will get this politically correct world to willingly and knowingly agree to unite together in worship of a man and be agreeing to kill those who do not want to do that. Alice Bailey, or rather the demon speaking through her, recognized that the world teacher or Maitreya would need a monumental change in the paradigm of the world in order to accept him. Although she had a huge system called the plan, which we'll talk about in detail later, to prepare the world for this world teacher, she also recognized that ultimately, in order to make it work, it had to come on the heels of some type of tremendous chaos. She said, quote, only universal disaster could have brought men to a state of mind wherein such propositions and solutions could be presented. She also said that they, speaking of these spiritual beings like the coming world teacher or the Maitreya, they come in times of crisis. They frequently create crises in order to bring an end to the old and the undesirable and make way for the new and more suitable forms for the evolving life of God imminent in nature. They come when evil is rampant. For this reason, if for no other, an avatar may be looked for today. The necessary stage is set for the reappearance of the Christ. So again, she's saying that the order 
of the phoenix, basically. The, this, this phoenix will rise out of the ashes of the chaos. And real briefly, that is what I think this symbol means. The double-headed eagle of Lagash is essentially a double-headed phoenix that rises out of chaos. The order ab Cal means order out of chaos. I think this is representative of the satanic trinity. The 33 upside-down pyramid there is representative of Satan. And Satan, as it says in the Bible, gives his authority to this beast. The beast is the false prophet and antichrist, which is 666 is a uh, third is 33.33333 and I think that is what is represented by the number 33 but this is really a side issue the main thing that I wanted to, to say here is that chaos is the thing that's going to bring this order of their phoenix but the crucial thing to realize here is that she knew that the new world religion, as she called it, would not be accomplished by the spreading of the ideals of the new religion of lo alone, which is the new age belief. She recognized that something that he, the phoenix, did would cause the world to throw away all the religions and embrace the new one. She understood the magnitude of what was required in order to inaugurate a world religion. I throw around the term world religion all the time, but it means that Hindus and Buddhists and Muslims, atheists and many Christians will gladly and at the same time apostatize to join this new religion. So here are some quotes from her about how this world teacher, or the Antichrist as I'm just going to start calling him, will inaugurate the new religion. She says, it was pointed out then that the first move which the Christ would make would be the stimulation of the spiritual consciousness in man, the evocation of humanity's spiritual demands on a large scale, and the nurturing on a worldwide scale of the Christ consciousness in the human heart. So the first thing that he does is change the world's religious paradigm. In this next quote, she's going to refer to the Christ as she often does to refer to the world teacher. And she's even going to refer to him as 2,000 years ago, um, making him synonymous with Jesus of Nazareth. But she would be the first to tell you but that she doesn't think that it's the same Jesus that the Christians believe. She's got a long story. So don't let it confuse you when she calls him the Christ, because she certainly doesn't, and theosophy definitely doesn't think that he is the same Christ in the way that we think about him. She says, The motivation for this reappearance is complete and settled. It is clearly perceived by the Christ. The work initiated by him 2,000 years ago must be completed. The new world religion must be inaugurated. That's the important part there. The inauguration of this new religion is to begin with his reappearance. I've got two more quotes from her on this point because it is a really important thing to realize. She says that this, the New World Religion will do, and its implementation will proceed apace after the reappearance of the Christ. So again, the real work of changing the religions is going to happen after he shows up. So they can only do so much to spread the New Age ideas, because ultimately it's going to require his appearance to actually make it all happen and to make the entire world believe it. And finally on this point she says, When the Christ appears, the non-essentials will surely disappear. The fundamentals of faith will remain, upon which he can build that new world religion for which all men wait. So his appearance is essentially the foundation from which the new world religion will be built. Now, although the world teacher was needed to actually empower this religious system, Bailey by no means planned to sit idly by and wait for it to happen. In the meantime, she saw it as crucial to infiltrate all areas of influence with the ideas that would be needed in order to accept the change when he did come. She says the present world order, which is today largely disorder, can be so modified and changed that a new world and a new race of men can gradually come into being. Renunciation and the use of the sacrificial will should be the keynote for the interim period after the war prior to the inauguration of the new age. So she's saying that the mindset must be modified and changed in order to achieve this new race of men, this new world. 
Another quote that we've already read, and I'll try not to do this again, but this one is really important for this idea that she is interested in the propaganda of changing people's minds about this. She says, this must form the theme of all the propaganda work to be done during the next few decades until the year 2025, a brief space of time indeed to produce fundamental changes in human thought, awareness, and direction, but at the same time, a quite possible achievement provided the new group of world servers and the men of women of goodwill perform a conscientious task. Now, besides all this propaganda work, it also becomes clear in her writings that there's more than just preparing the world in this religious sense for the Antichrist. There's also a very complex plan to prepare the world for a world government. Now, this quote is from the Lucius Trust website, and it's from the so-called purposes and objectives of an organization called World Goodwill which is an accredited non-governmental organization with the Department of Public Information of the United Nations. It says, When the world teacher and present head of the spiritual hierarchy, the Christ, will reappear among humanity to sound the keynote of the New Age, there are millions of mentally alert men and women in all parts of the world who are on rapport with the plan and work to give it expression. They provide opportunity for cooperation with the spiritual evolution of humanity. There is no group so likely to ensure that humanity achieves this most difficult goal as the men and women of goodwill, requiring only courage to initiate action to prepare for the new world order. So part of this preparation for the new world order, according to her, is to build up a, a United Nations or an international body that can form a world government. And she also says that it's needed in order to prepare for his appearance. She says, first of all, he will come to a world which is essentially one world. His reappearance and his consequent work cannot be confined to one small locality or domain unheard of by the great majority, as was the case when he was here before. So she's saying that he needs a system built up for him before he will appear, and clarifies that in this quote when she says, his disciples in every land know that he will reappear when they have done the needed preparatory work. She talks a lot about the need for building up the United Nations, Keep in mind when I read this next quote, this was written just a year after the United Nations was founded. It says, When the United Nations has emerged into a factual and actual power, the welfare of the world will then be assured. We are attempting to do it on a vast scale, and this in spite of opposition, an opposition which can only temporarily succeed. These things are the things which the hierarchy, in its already successful procedures, is aiding and will continue to aid. So she's saying that there is opposition to the United Nations growing, but the spiritual dimension is helping them out. So she always talks about the people that will put forward this agenda, whether it's the propaganda work and preparing the minds of people, or whether it's the actual on-the-ground forming of the world government. She always calls them the new group of world servers, sometimes the men and women of goodwill. So here's a few quotes from her about them. Members of the new group of world servers and the men and women of goodwill must be sought for in every department of life. They will be found among the adherents of all the current ideologies and in political and scientific circles, among the world educators and philanthropists, among the creative workers, the industrialists, in ordinary homes and in the ranks of labor. I, Master Dejoacul, call on all men and women of goodwill in the world to study the principles of the new world order. Another quote says, they will thus create world public opinion, which will be so forceful and so outspoken on the side of human welfare that leaders, statesmen, politicians, businessmen, and churchmen will be forced to listen and comply. Steadily and regularly, the general public must be taught an internationalism and a world unity which is based on simple goodwill and on cooperative interdependence. So this system works in such a way that there doesn't need to be any real physical human organization that sends out orders. Workers in the new group of world servers, for instance, don't need to know that that's even what they're doing. The thing that makes this work is that the orders are not coming from Lucius Trust Publishing Company or anything like that, but rather from the so-called hierarchy. In other words, these spiritual beings that so many people in the New Age are involved with. In fact, most of the current New Age gurus claim to be in contact with some kind of spiritual beings, whatever they think that they are. And that's why the new age is crucial. Um, a lot of people right now are being seduced into getting into the occult because they think it's you know, going to lead them to spiritual transformation or something. But the occult 
activities are opening up doors to these spiritual beings. It's kind of a step-by-step -step process. First, they blow their mind with whatever paradigm-shattering stuff that they have. The people then get into the occult. The occult stuff then opens doors to the spiritual beings. A certain percentage of those people will then begin to communicate with those beings, and those beings' agenda is to set up the world for the Antichrist system, whether it's preparing people's minds or whether it's putting different things in place for the actual governmental system. Communicating with these spirits or channeling is really the foundation of the New Age. Some of the most famous names in the New Age movement claim not just to have spirit guides, but that those guides are the ones feeding them some of, or, or if not all, of their information. And we've already seen with the two people who were really the foundation of the New Age, Helena Blavatsky and Alice Bailey, how they both were in contact with so-called ascended masters or spiritual beings that they believe to be highly evolved. But we see the same pattern over and over in the New Age. A Course in Miracles is a really famous New Age book written by Helen Schumann. It was channeled and she didn't even want people to know that she was involved with the channeling until after her death. The entity claimed to be Jesus, but she referred to the entity as it. She said it always resumed dictation precisely where it left off. Shirley MacLaine, who was really instrumental in popularizing the New Age in the 70s, her spirit guide was named Ramtha, and she channeled Ramtha through Jay-Z Knight. Jay-Z Knight is the woman behind the Ramtha cult that produced the hit pop movie, The Bleep Do We Know, that was all put together by Jay-Z Knight, and she's channeling Ramtha actually throughout the course of that movie. Um, also, Conversations with God, a guy named Neil Donald Walsh. According to the title, it's God that was speaking to him, but he, the method was also channeled. He said it was like taking dictation. Really quickly on Neil Donald Walsh, Neil Donald Walsh, in a section of his book, he thanks a guy named Robert Mueller, who was instrumental in the United Nations in setting up all these programs like UNESCO, the, the World Core Curriculum program where he basically told people how to teach their kids. That whole program was dedicated to Alice Bailey and Dejwa Cool specifically. He said that's the principles in which uh, his legislation was guided by. So really interesting connection there to Neil Donald Walsh and Alice Bailey. Aleister Crowley wrote the Book of the Law. He attributed that particular book to a spiritual being named Hiawas. Edgar Casey, Levi Dowling, both the Akashic Records were the Universal Mind. The Seth material, very seductive set of material written by, as you would guess, Seth. It's actually pretty sad. The lady who was forced to write this by this entity, really, it, it, it destroyed her life. It's a very sad story about uh, this entity and basically taking control of, of this, uh, this woman. David Icke also has spiritual beings that, when you really look into it, that really control all the information that he gives people. And the sad thing about it is he never questions who these entities are. He literally says he doesn't know and he doesn't care who they are. And we really could go on and on with this list, especially in regard to the modern New Age or truth movement. People like Jordan Maxwell and the Pleiadians that he believes he's been in contact with. Or, or David Wilcock and the Egyptian god Ra. There's rarely anything in the modern New Age movement that we haven't been handed on a silver spoon from these spiritual entities. 1 Timothy 4 verse 1 says, In the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. So what are these doctrines of devils and what do they have to do with the latter times as it says here in this verse? I've read a lot of channeled material, that is material that the author claims they didn't write but rather a spiritual entity wrote through them. And when you read that type of material, it has very common themes. First, it's very seductive. It's very intelligent. But the themes that are there are very consistent. And I'm just going to put this list here. This list should actually look somewhat familiar to us because it's very similar to the core New Age beliefs that we looked at earlier. So here's a list of the things that are very, very common in material that comes from channeled spiritual beings. They seem to be very focused on these five things. Number one, the new age will replace the old one. Number two, the old age is tied to biblical Christianity, the coming evolution of humanity, 
that man is or can become like God, and finally a unification of the world systems. So I'm going to take a look at these one by one and show you why demons would be pushing these specific things and what purpose they might have in the Antichrist's kingdom. So first, on this point that the new age will replace an old age. For that, let's take a quote from Helena Blavatsky, the founder of the Theosophical Society. She says, Theosophists, at any rate some of them, know that it is no end of the world, but the consummation of the age, i.e. the close of a cycle which is now fast approaching. Again, the messianic cycle of the man connected with Pisces. It is a cycle historical and not very long, but very occult, lasting 2,155 years. When it enters in a few years, the sign of Aquarius, psychologists will have some extra work to do, and the psychic idiosyncrasies of humanity will enter on a great change. So the main thing that I want you to get out of this is that she's saying that this new age, the one called the age of Aquarius, will replace the old age, which she is tying to you know, biblical Christianity. And she's saying in the new age, all kinds of stuff is going to change. You know, Psychologists are going to need to do all this work. So this new age will replace the old one. That's the main thing that I want you to get out of that. But we're going to have to take this opportunity real quick to debunk this fundamental idea of the new age. That is the age concept, which I will demonstrate is a very modern idea and something that no ancient person would make the claim of. But we need to really understand what she's saying there because it's a fundamental principle of the new age that is totally wrong. So you can look at that backdrop there on the screen. You've got Aries and Pisces and Aquarius. All these are constellations. Now, you can see there on the bottom the horizon, that's the Earth, what it looks like from the Earth's perspective. Now, over a 26,000 year period, because this is changing as a result of the precession of the equinoxes, or the wobble of the Earth, so the Earth wobbles and completes a wobble every 26,000 years, and as a result, the stars that we see on the horizon shift. So the concept is, that on the equinox, wherever the sun breaks free from the horizon, if you're watching the sunrise, wherever that is, whatever constellation is in back of that is whatever age that we're in. And there's a lot of debate among astrologers as to exactly when we will enter into the next age and all that. But first I wanted you to understand what they're claiming when they say we're in the age of Pisces right now and we're about to enter the age of Aquarius. That's essentially how that they are mapping that age shift. Now I'm going to read to you a refutation of a woman named Acharya S. who was behind a lot of the information in the Zeitgeist films, very popular on um, the internet. And he is a professor at the University of Chicago of astronomy and astrophysics. He's writing a book on Renaissance astronomy. I could read a lot of his credentials, but to make a long story short, he's very qualified to answer Acharya S.'s and basically Helena Blavatsky's claim that the Bible was written um, to describe the age shift because it's a physical impossibility for a number of reasons. So I'm going to really quickly read this rebuttal from Dr. Noel Swerdlow and then I'm going to discuss Acharya S's response to it because I think you'll find that interesting as well. He says, In antiquity, constellations were just groups of stars and there were no borders separating the regions of one from the regions of another. Within which group of stars the vernal equinox was located was of no astrological significance at all. The modern ideas about the age of Pisces or the age of Aquarius are based upon the location of the vernal equinox in the regions of the stars of those constellations. But the regions, the borders between those constellations, are a completely modern convention of the International Astronomical Union for the purpose of mapping, and never had any astrological significance. I hope this is helpful, although in truth what this woman is claiming is so wacky that it is hardly worth answering. So when this woman says that the Christian fish was a symbol of the coming age of Pisces, she is saying something that no one would have thought of in antiquity, because in which constellation of the fixed stars the vernal equinox was located was of no significance and is entirely an idea of modern, I believe, 20th century astrology. In Acharya's response to this, she essentially just talks about how the ancient peoples knew about the zodiac in some form or another for a long time. But that's not at all what is of concern here. What's of concern is, did the ancient people think that the location of the equinox among one of the other zodiacal constellations or the age concept as we see in modern astrology exist? 
So she never addresses this real fundamental point. Did the ancient peoples even believe in an age concept? Not only is that important for her astrotheology, but for the new age in general, the whole concept. Did they in fact believe in an age concept in order to create the Bible to make it be talking about a coming age? So everything is resting on this point. She never addresses it. In fact, she does quote a guy named Dr. Edwin Krupp to address her straw man argument that they didn't believe that they did believe in constellations, which is obviously everybody would agree on that point. So what Lacona does is he emails her source that she's using to prove her points and asks him about the actual problem of Dr. Noel Swerdlow's point about the age concept. And her source, Dr. Edwin Krupp, says this, Professor Swerdlow is well informed on the ancient history of astronomy and astrology, and his report to you reflects current scholarly opinion formulated by textual evidence. Although people have traditionally projected terrestrial concerns and priorities onto the sky in celestial myth, the detailed astrological mapping your opponent advocates is not supported by evidence and certainly cannot be tracked back two millennia or more as described. And I don't really think you can overemphasize this from the point of trying to debunk astrotheology or New Age ideas. It really is a crucial point to make known. But unfortunately, it doesn't matter if you take this idea of the Age of Aquarius away from them because they have been selling the idea of the New Age using so many different contradictory ideas that if you take this one away, they'll still have any number of outs, for instance, maybe 2012 or the idea of entering into a photon belt. All of these specifically have been debunked too, but there's just such a sheer number and, and widely held belief that we are entering into a new age that unfortunately it doesn't do all that much good to debunk this primary idea of the age of Aquarius anyway. But the next part of this is something that you're going to see in the channeled material and I mean they spend pages and pages and pages on this this concept. Once they introduce the idea that a new age is coming, the next step is to show that the old age has failed. I think Alice Bailey really sums up the importance for preaching this when she says, only universal disaster could have brought men to a state of mind wherein such propositions and solutions could be presented. The general recognition that the old order has lamentably failed is most valuable. Now, that failing of the old age really gets teeth because they spend so much time, again, chapters and chapters, tying the failing of the old age to Christianity. They almost become synonymous. The old age is tied to Christianity. Usually this is done very subtly, very prominent in people like David Icke, Michael Tassarian, Jordan Maxwell, on and on. This is a quote from Acharya S. in her book, The Christ Conspiracy, when she's quoting Edwin Carpenter from the Fabian Society. She says, As far as Christianity's role in the New Age, Carpenter states, Christianity, therefore, as I say, must either now come frankly forward and acknowledge its parentage from the great order of the past, seek to rehabilitate that and carry mankind one step forward in the path of evolution, or else it must perish. There is no alternative. Despite the vilification of the so-called New Age movement, the fact is that we are entering into a New Age. The age referred to in the gospel tale is that of Pisces, and through contrivance and duplicity, coercion and slaughter, the fish god Jesus, the Piscean solar avatar, has indeed been with us. But now it is the close of the age, and his time is over. And it's not just that they are tying the old age to Christianity. It's that they also spend a whole lot of time trying to tie Christianity to all the problems of the world by proxy saying that when Christianity is gone, all of our trouble will also be gone. And they do this by generally tying Christianity to Catholicism or the Crusades, which I would of course submit has nothing to do with the Bible and certainly anything to do with Jesus's worldview is in fact directly opposed to all that. I discuss that in some detail in my video religious wars fact or fiction and essentially showing that governments have motives for manipulating people using religion and distorting religion but it has nothing to do with in fact the biblical Christianity worldview whatsoever. Jesus of course says love your enemies 
and that does not play well politically if you have uh, land or people or resources to take over. So manipulation and often keeping the Bible from the people was what you really see in the Dark Ages as opposed to a biblically literate people. That is exactly the opposite of what history teaches. Nevertheless, Annie Woodbesant in Lucifer Theosophist magazine in April 1925 says the following, The equinox will reach the sign of Aquarius and coinciding the great cycle of influence, we can indeed hope to put a complete end to all the influence of the past cycle with its tyranny, slavery, war, and cruelty. This is one of the great transitional epochs. And the karma before humanity as a whole, and to every group in particular, is to reform itself from slavery, female subjection, war, and cruelty, and establish a civilization based on humaneness and interest in spiritual matters. Alice Bailey also says, Our main objective at this time is twofold, to break the ancient evil rhythms and establish a new and better one. It is here that time is a paramount factor. If we can delay the crystallization of the ancient evils, which produced the world war, and arrest the reactionary forces in every nation, we shall be making way for that which is new and opening the door to the activities of the new group of world servers in every land, that group which is the agent of the Christ. And because of this, there is a subtle anticipation of a coming genocide of Christians. Now, a lot of them don't come right out and say it. Alice Bailey is a little more coy about it. David Icke is a little coy. Michael Tassarian is a little coy. But it's all there. They very subtly imply that it is necessary in this new change in order to deal with the people who don't want to go into the change. They're going to be holding the rest of the people back from their superpowers and the ability to have their promised utopia. And so there is subtle and not so subtle references to this in the New Age literature. Alice Bailey in the externalization of the hierarchy says, In a similar period of extreme carnage and blood, it will be fought largely, but read not exclusively, with mental weapons and in the world of thought. It will involve also the emotional realm from the standpoint of idealistic fanaticism. This inherent fanaticism will fight against the reappearance of the coming world religion and the spread of esotericism. So she's saying that to expect this resistance from Christians of this new world religion and this new esotericism that's coming. And this is very, very prominent in New Age literature. Here are some not so subtle references to this from Barbara Marks Hubbard, who was channeling an entity in the Book of Co-Creation in the 1980 edition. And she says this, Out of the full spectrum of human personality, one-fourth is electing to transcend. So, one-fourth wants to join this new world religion, this new system. But one-fourth is resistant to election. So, you can basically read Christians here with this one-fourth that's resistant to election because she certainly makes that very clear in other places. She says, They are unattracted by life ever-evolving. Now, as we approach the quantum shift from creature human to co-creative human, so she's saying we're going to turn into godlike beings, the destructive one-fourth must be eliminated from the social body. Fortunately, you, dearly beloveds, again, this is a, a channeled spiritual being talking through her, she says, fortunately, you, dearly beloveds, are not responsible for this act. We are. We are in charge of God's selection process for planet Earth. He selects, we destroy. We are the riders of the pale horse death. We're going to hear more from Barbara Marks Hubbard here in a minute. But first, here is a quote from David Icke from his book, And the Truth Will Set You Free. He is talking about Christians here when he says the those who follow the propaganda of the global elite and the prison warder consciousness. He's very subtle about that. You couldn't really pin him down on it. But there are many different ways you can see that he is he's specifically talking about those who believe in Christianity, among others, but that is certainly his primary focus. He says, Others who follow the propaganda of the global elite and the prison warder consciousness will cling to the old vibration in their desperation to find security. They will become ever more vehement in their religious, political, and economic dogma. They will resist the rising vibrations if they choose that path. And this will have mental, emotional, and physical effects. These two states of being, the programmed mind and the open mind, will be more obvious with every month to those who know what is happening. So you might be getting an idea of how this could play into the false peace of the Antichrist system, but don't worry, I'm going to explain more about that in just a second. 
But another consistent doctrine of demons is the idea that humanity should expect an evolution very soon. Often this idea is preceded by a long explanation of regular, you know, Darwinian type evolution, like in the case of Barbara Marx Hubbard, who we just read, that's a big part of her presentations, is explaining regular evolution and then saying that, you know, since species evolve, we are also about to evolve into something new. But that's not always how it's done. Sometimes they say that we're not actually going to look different, but only our spirits will evolve. Others say that we will actually be changed into light beings and no longer exist on the physical plane. All kinds of variations about that. So I mention all that just to show you that it doesn't matter how you come to believe that a spiritual evolution is coming. What is important is that you believe it. And another aspect of that is that this spiritual evolution is supposed to be based on your religious preferences according to them. We just read all those quotes where it was saying that you know these certain people, they will choose not to evolve. And the reason is, is because they were stuck in the old system. They were too brainwashed by the old system. So that's code for these Christians wouldn't give up their Christianity and wouldn't join the utopia and therefore become the world's greatest enemy. I want to quickly point out why the Christians won't join this new utopia, even if it looks really, really good and really solid. The reason why it's specifically Christians is because it was specifically Christians that were warned about this false utopia that will pretend to be good and look good and everything about it will seem good, but they have been warned that it isn't good. That and that's a criticism that people often say about Christians in the Bible. They they will say, well, the Illuminati wrote the Bible because they want to get everybody to believe that it's the return of Christ. And so they'll essentially, you know, think that the New World Order is good. But that explanation makes no sense if you've actually read the Bible and understand prophecy. What it's saying is, yes, Jesus is going to return. And before that, Armageddon and everything happens. But before that... There is going to be a, a false utopia, a false peace, a false world government, a false world religion forced on everybody and to resist it at all costs because it isn't what it seems. That's the element that people seem to forget when they're putting that charge in the Bible and saying, well, you know, the Bible was written by the Illuminati. If it was, then it's the most ridiculous thing for them ever to do because it is essentially the most anti-New World Order document on the face of the planet. So getting back to this idea of the spiritual evolution of humanity and this new system, the idea is that every good thing is going to be possible in this new Atlantean system. All wars are going to be over, all the people are going to live in peace, and as a bonus, everyone's going to have superpowers as well. David Icke literally quotes a demon at the end of every one of his lectures. This quote is pretty much indicative of a lot of the channeled information, but I just wanted to read it to again solidify the mindset that's being taught here. He says, In 1990 I experienced this, and it stood the test of time in my experience. It says, My own allegiance to your planet goes back to the Atlantean period. As the energies around your planet quicken, so these latent energies. These energies that were withdrawn were now being phased back in. They will gradually be awakened as the consciousness level of your planet raises itself. Those of you who are working together to raise your consciousness, you will be able to hold more and more refined vibrations, and the energies themselves contain the knowledge which is beginning to surface again in your consciousness. Many of you will remember the Atlantean times. You will remember you communicated with, say, dolphins and whales. You understood these sentient creatures. You could levitate. You could manifest things. You could cause spontaneous combustion, not by miraculous means at all. Once you know what you're doing, these things follow. It is a matter of order. Now I'm looking at a time on your planet when these energies are reawakened and reintegrated into your consciousness. And here's a few more quotes about this idea that the evolution is only going to affect those who can agree with the new system. Here is Barbara Marx Hubbard again. She says, The end of this phase of evolution shall come. All will know their choice. All will be required to choose. All who choose to be natural Christs will be guided from within as to how to proceed. All those who choose not to evolve will die off. The kindergarten class of the earth will be over. So again, the idea is that this spiritual evolution is one that people are either going to choose to embrace the new system, the new utopia, the new world religion, or they will choose not to. So the evolution in the future, according to all the channeled information, is all about essentially your religious preference. 
in fact, there's a lot of suggestion in this channel material that everyone else's evolution and their superpowers, etc., are being held back by those who are still holding on to the old age. So the Christians or the people that are choosing not to evolve into this new system are going to prevent the other people from getting their evolution. David Icke says, We are now entering a period of fantastic change. And the happening of events are speeding up all the time. We have two challenges here in front of us. People have to get access to that information and to start to realize who they really are and the natural, the, the nature of life that we can go into this stage to, which is this incredible consciousness shift that's going to happen and is happening with many people already, but can happen for everybody if we open up to the knowledge of what's going on. And to do that, the edifice of suppression has to go. Bill Cooper, studying all this stuff, said, But this callous disregard for the right to life of every human on the planet has been predicted before in the New Testament. John was moved to write, Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God's service. The New World Order, ladies and gentlemen, will sail in on a sea of blood. The next doctrine is that man is or can become like God. So here are a few quotes from channeled material. Ramtha, speaking through Jay-Z Knight, said, What be you? You are God. In A Course in Miracles, it says, Jesus became what all of you must be. Is he the Christ? Oh yes, along with you. Benjamin Krim said, Man is an emerging God. So you've got the evolutionary godhood idea there. By the way, Benjamin Krim also wrote a book called The Reappearance of the Christ and the Masters of Wisdom that has nothing to do with Alice Bailey's book, The Reappearance of the Christ. And in my estimation, Benjamin Krim is essentially just a, a fanboy of Alice Bailey. He, he's really of no real significance in this whole scheme of things. And the final doctrine here is world unity. You see this in almost all channeled material. There's some type of unification of world systems promoted. Often it is associated with a utopian ideal or some kind of Atlantis connection, a resourceless economy or something. We've already seen a lot of examples of this already in some of the material that we've already quoted. So I'm just going to jump right into how some of these doctrines are going to specifically play into the Antichrist system. So we'll take these first two together. The idea that the New Age will replace the Old One and the Old Age is tied to Christianity. This one has more of the concept of kind of scraping off the old paint before you apply the new paint. Both of these have you know, application to getting the world to reject God. The Antichrist will be instituting a new religion, one that mocks the idea of the God of the Bible. Eventually, he will declare himself to be higher than God, higher than anything called God. Daniel 7, Daniel 11, 2 Thessalonians, Revelation 13. So he will need to thoroughly convince the world that the God of the Bible has been completely discredited. And the second part of that, that the old age is tied to Christianity. We talked about how that they made such a big deal about how all the, all the wars of the past were because of Christians and everything. So part of the strength of his kingdom will be the apparent new victory of, of their separating themselves from that old system, that age of Christianity. So it will, in a sense, be defined by its rebellion against the Bible. That matches up actually pretty nicely with the Bible's description of the Antichrist in the sense that he is described as a, a proud blasphemer, a boaster against the God of the Bible. And I think that, that makes sense if his kingdom is essentially defined by its separateness from the Bible. We'll take these next two together as well. First, the coming evolution of humanity and that man is or can become like God. So how do these relate to the coming Antichrist system? They're what I call the carrot on the string, in a sense. This idea that they can attain godhood if certain conditions are met. This is, I think, going to be part of the motivation for humanity to do what Satan wants them to do, which is to eliminate Christians. We see that in Revelation 12, 17 and other places. He needs a politically correct modern people to do this for him, to carry out this genocide. I think we've seen this beta tested in Germany in the 1930s. It, Germany was a pretty progressive place in the 30s, but they got normal people to get on board with a genocide. And they did it really based on the idea of this coming evolution. Um, the idea that they were helping the world evolve by eliminating the unfit. 
And I don't have time here to go into the Nazi belief in theosophy or the so-called Atlantean fifth root race that were, you know, was believed in by Hitler and, and Himmler and all that. But let's just say that this idea of getting people to be on board with a religious genocide has been beta tested and it worked. Except next time it's going to be on a much bigger scale and far wor worse in its, uh, in its uh, severity. And this last one is easy. Almost all the descriptions of what the Antichrist will do in the Bible require a physical world unified system. From implementing the Mark of the Beast system and governing of the buying and selling, the Antichrist will try to change the set times and laws, Daniel 7. He's going to need manpower and a police state structure to carry out the genocide. It says that the Antichrist will gather the kings of the earth and their armies together to make war against Jesus Christ as he returns, Revelation 19. Plus, Revelation 13, 7 says quite plainly that the Antichrist will rule every tribe, people, language, and nation. You may remember earlier that I mentioned that something big would have to happen in order to change this world as it currently is into a world that would gladly do these things. I mean, a world economy, sure, might be right around a corner, but not a world economy which forces everybody to pledge their allegiance to a particular man or you know there is anti-christian sentiment out there but not anti-christian sentiment that will lead to all the world deciding to kill all christians so something big is needed to happen and i'm going to propose how this could be done there are surely numerous ways that that could happen but i want to share with you a way that i am personally convinced that it will happen Although, listen, I'm, I want to stress this. I am not dogmatic about it. I wouldn't be surprised if this all came together in a completely different way. But I do feel that I, I should share how I think this paradigm shift could happen. I think it could be done with an alien or UFO deception. Again, deception is the key word there. I'm not proposing to know what form this deception will take. It could be a number of options, like aliens you know, supposedly showing up stepping out of craft, landing on the White House lawn kind of thing. Or it could be some sighting of craft, perhaps hovering over different cities like we've seen in different uh, movies. It could be some discovery on Mars or another planet or some other quote-unquote proof of life on other planets. It could be some archaeological discovery, perhaps in or around the pyramids or something similar to that. It could be a holographic event, which, of course, the technology of which is apparently available anyway. It really doesn't matter. The effect of any one of those things would be the same. And it's the effects of this proposed event that I want to talk about. It should be noted that I do not believe that what people experience as alien abductions are actual aliens from other planets. Here's some quotes from some interesting people. Interesting because they are, you know, members of the military or really heavily involved in the study of UFOs, but they're not necessarily Christians. Some of them obviously not Christians, but they have studied the UFO phenomenon in depth. The first one is from Arthur C. Clarke. He says, One theory which can no longer be taken very seriously is that UFOs are interstellar spaceships. George Crichton, in a 1992 Flying Saucer Review policy statement, says, There seems to be no evidence yet that any of these craft or beings originate from outer space. Lynn Cato, in an Air Force document, says, A large part of the available UFO literature is closely linked with mysticism and the metaphysical. It deals with subjects like mental telepathy, automatic writing, invisible entities, as well as phenomena like poltergeist and ghost manifestation and possession. Many of the UFO reports now being published in the popular press recount alleged incidences that are strikingly similar to demonic possession and psychic phenomenon. Dr. Pierre Gurin says UFO behavior is more akin to magic than to physics as we know it. The modern UFO knots and the demons of the past are probably identical. John Keel says the UFO manifestations seem to be, by and large, merely minor variations of the age-old demonological phenomenon. Trevor James in Flying Saucer Review says a working knowledge of occult science is indispensable to UFO investigation. Whitley Strieber, who is probably one of the most famous UFO abductees, in his writings describes the evilness of these entities and that they had to be demons. There's so many quotes from him on this. Of course, nowadays he's very, very new age in his belief and he sort of he sort of backtracks from a lot of the things that he said originally about that. 
But I think that the best evidence of all is the fact that certain people that have experienced a so-called alien abduction have reported that when they called out to Jesus, the attacks totally stopped. And it didn't matter if they thought they were on some spaceship being tortured or whatever, they were immediately back in their bed. Oftentimes, the people experiencing this are people that have been heavily involved in the occult or magic. In fact, Whitley Strieber in his early books were all about that theme, the occult ideas and magic and things like that. There are a few other reasons why people uh, begin to get this, but the large majority of them have opened up doors in their life by practicing magic in some way. I personally know the people involved with a ministry to help people who experience these attacks and they now have hundreds and hundreds of testimonies of people on their CE4 research group website. These are people that have ended their encounters with these demonic beings by calling out to Jesus for help and that have completely terminated them for good by giving their lives to him. Their mission statement on their website says that the mission of CE4 Research Group is to share with the world the most powerful evidence known that exposes the alien entities for who they really are. That evidence is in the testimonies of those who have overcome the experience, the oppression, the bondage, the harassment, the control, the lies, the deception that these entities perpetrate by calling out in the name and authority of Jesus Christ. Through this evidence of these testimonies, we will be able to help others. The world asks for this evidence and we will give it to them. We share this evidence through any means of communication available. So let's look at why I think that the alien deception idea would essentially do this impossible task. That is, make the world believe all the things on this list. Number one, for some reason the world equates a proof of extraterrestrial intelligent life to God not existing. I'm fond of referring to the movie Contact with Jodie Foster where they discovered a message of intelligent life elsewhere in the galaxy and the world immediately abandoned its faith in God, particularly the Christian God. In that movie there were terrorists who blew up the project to contact the entities. The terrorists in that movie were Christians. The idea was that they couldn't handle this new paradigm because they were too brainwashed. They were portrayed as the heathens of the old age. You know, if this alien deception happens, Christians who refuse to believe the official version of the story about aliens will become public enemy number one. They're going to be characterized as the poor souls who cannot adapt to the new thinking, the feeble-minded brainwashed who, even though their god has now been proven to be wrong, they go on talking about how the new aliens are holographic deceptions or worse, demons. You can just imagine the contempt that the world would have, you know, if they really believed that this proved that God didn't exist. They, in their minds, would think, well, the only reason is that Christians are still believing what they're believing is because they can't handle it, you know, they can't, they can't break free from all the years of programming. That's exactly what the world is going to believe. But the Christians are saying, no, no, we, we've been expecting this for a long time. The other thing that the alien deception would empower, in my opinion, in regard to the Antichrist system is this idea of the coming evolution and becoming God. I've always struggled with the idea of how could you get a common people, you know, farmers and factory workers and John and Jane Sixpack to believe that they're on the verge of a new AG evolution and that they can potentially become like gods and have powers and all this stuff but only if they knock out the Christians first. I mean, that's never going to happen. I mean, sure, maybe the extreme New Agers believe that, but not the whole normal world. They're not going to be on board with that. But I think the answer to that is the alien deception. And in the New Age, one of the most common views, if not the most common view, of what aliens are comes from a man named Zachariah Sitchin, who recently passed away. He claimed to be able to read Sumerian cuneiform and discovered that alien beings genetically modified prehistoric man's DNA and thus created mankind as they are known today. This theory is all over pop culture. The idea of aliens showing up in ancient times, building the pyramids, creating mankind using genetic technology. You know, you've got elements of this in recent blockbusters like Indiana Jones and the Crystal Skulls thing, the Transformers movie, the fourth kind, all kinds of stuff. We could go back and, and show this in many different uh, TV shows and movies and things. But this view of aliens genetically modifying 
humankind, the whole Zachariah Sitchin thing has been debunked by a man named Dr. Michael Heiser on his website, SitchinIsWrong.com. And if you know anybody that believes Zachariah Sitchin, please direct them to SitchinIsWrong.com. It's a very helpful resource for that and shows that Zachariah Sitchin either didn't know very basic elements of what he claimed to know or he was intentionally deceiving people. That's, that's my estimation of it anyway. It really doesn't matter if the theory that aliens were super technologically advanced and messed with prehistoric apes' DNA to create man is used or not. If they can be shown to exist at all, they will be perceived in a sense as gods. They will be, you know, so much further advanced than us, not just in terms of their technology, but what if the idea is floated that they can communicate telepathically or something? Then the idea is also planted that they are superior in some physical way, too. And that's just a hair's breadth away from claiming that we could expect to be able to become like them. I mean, if it's just a matter of evolution from us on Earth, you know, eventually give us enough time, and it's a matter of evolution. We can evolve these psychic powers like then. We can evolve the knowledge of space travel. If the world believed aliens existed, they would also, once they thought about it for a while, also believe that they could be evolved into godlike beings. And the problem of getting the farmers and the factory workers, not just New Agers, to believe this potential evolution idea is totally solved. And finally, how would aliens solve the problem of world unification? I believe that aliens, the idea of them anyway, would make us willingly give up our sovereignty, our flags, our constitutions. We would believe ourselves to be part of a new galactic family. You know, we're Earthlings, not Americans and and Egyptians and, or whatever. It would make national sovereignty totally obsolete. There's this famous quote from Henry Kissinger in 1991 that says, Today America would be outraged if UN troops entered Los Angeles to restore order. Tomorrow they will be grateful. This is especially true if they were told that there were an outside threat from beyond whether real or promulgated, that threatened our very existence. It is then that all peoples of the world would plead to deliver them from this evil. The one thing that man fears is the unknown. When presented with this scenario, individual rights will be willingly relinquished for the guarantee of their well-being guaranteed to them by the world government. And President Ronald Reagan had stated that if we were attacked by a power from outer space, then the world would unite into one. 1985, he told Mikhail Gorbachev at the Geneva summit meeting that I couldn't help but say to him just how easy his task and mine might be in these meetings that we held if suddenly there was a threat to this world from another species, from another planet outside the universe. We'd forget all the little local differences that we have between our countries, and we would find out once and for all that we are really all human beings here on the earth together. And then I have other quotes here from the New York Times about essentially the same thing. So you have this outline that is, number one, part of a core New Age belief system. Number two is part of everything that has ever been channeled, part of these doctrine of demons coming from the spiritual source, telling people to teach others these same things. And those same things just happen to be the exact same things needed by the Antichrist to implement his system, which I postulate also could be empowered or put together by an alien deception. In conclusion, the New Age is just a blueprint. It's a blueprint that has an encoded agenda. I think the New Age, as we know it today, is growing, and it goes by many other names other than New Age. It, it's just a series of core ideas spread in various ways. The New Age ideas, without exception, come from channeled material, and that is from demonic spirits. And those spirits are under orders, kind of like a military system, to set up the kingdom from which Satan will force the world to worship him. The good news is that this has all been foretold and we know who wins. Christ is absolutely victorious in this battle of good and evil. And in light of this immensely important time and the great battle that lies ahead, I implore you to be reconciled to God through Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, He made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So he made him who knew no sin. That is, Christ lived a perfect life for 30 plus years with a perfect record. He made him to be sin. That is, that God put on him your sin. If you repent, change your mind. Be willing to turn from your sin. 
You might not have the power to do it. You might not be able to do it very well, but you must be willing to do it. And that same willingness, that same turning is also turning towards the Lord and being willing to make him the Lord of your life. So if you repent and believe this gospel, then when he looks at that cross 2,000 years ago, he sees your sins. And when he looks at you, he sees the perfect life that Christ lived. So we give Christ our sin to be punished by a just and good and loving God. And he gives us his righteousness so that we can enjoy the rightness before God that he deserved, not us. That's why it said in Romans 8, 1, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. He will give you a new nature. It says that if any man is in Christ, he's a new creature. This new nature has new desires. You won't be perfect, but you will begin to be perfected. And it's a process that will last the rest of your life. And you're going to walk in the love and the forgiveness and the peace and fellowship with God. So lay down your rebellion. Lay down this rebellion against this king of kings. Trust in Christ for your salvation, redemption, forgiveness, and freedom from the bondage of sin and the fear of death. Thanks for your time.